Welcome all, my name is John Bird, and I'm representing the Strategic Studies Department here at Joint Special Operations University. Today we are pleased to present a distinguished speaker, including audience Q&A. This session is unclassified and will be recorded and posted to the JSAO network. Please keep in mind that the views and the opinions expressed by all participants do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the U.S. government, Department of Defense, or U.S. SOCOM. Thanks, John, and good afternoon to everyone. I want to welcome everyone to another online interview of Think JSAL. Think JSAL is an ongoing program that explores research and publications of leading academics and the wider soft international security community, as well as our own JSAL faculty, resident senior fellows, and the global soft community. The online collection of Think JSAL webinars includes interviews and conversations with authors and researchers and is intended to supplement existing publications, articles, and other active discussions. I encourage everyone to explore the complete Think JSAL collection by reviewing our online offerings posted to the Strategic Studies Department site through our library page and JSAL social media sites. Today, Dr. David Ellis, Dr. Human Sadri, and Dr. Diane Zori join us to discuss their 2020 JSAL publication entitled Iranian Proxy Groups in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen, a Principal Agent Comparative Analysis. Dr. Ellis is a resident senior fellow at JSAL, and he holds a doctorate in international relations and comparative politics from the University of Florida with a focus on democratization and development in identity conflict. Dr. Ellis served as an intelligence analyst in the US SOCOM J2 and deployed to Afghanistan in support of Special Operations Forces in 2010 and 2011. Dr. Sadri is the Deputy Director of the International Policy and Analysis Center and specializes in foreign relations and security studies with a concentration in the Persian Gulf and Caspian Sea states. Dr. Sadri earned a doctorate from, uni from the University of Virginia with a concentration in foreign relations and international security and completed a fellowship focused on the same topic the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. Dr. Zori is an assistant professor of security studies at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and serves as a subject matter expert to JSAL on research issues involving security and governance in the Middle East. Graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy, the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School, and George Mason, Mason University. She served as a U.S. Air Force officer and also worked for the multinational force Iraq in Baghdad. Doctors, welcome to Think JSAL. Thank you for joining me this morning. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let me begin by saying the title of your work about Iranian proxy groups, namely proxy groups in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen, they seem a bit self-explanatory. One can assume many foregone conclusions commonly hold in the Department of Defense about Iran's relationships with her main proxies. However, once I delved into your book, I quickly learned the situation is far more complex between Iran and her proxies than seems readily apparent. In particular, you state in the introduction that Tehran seeks to keep regional conflicts in the, quote, gray zone to gain a strategic advantage and make themselves indispensable. This certainly means different things to the various subnational actors vying for power and influence in these three countries. And you state, by examining the dynamics involved uh, we can not only better understand proxy warfare, but also there is a broader lesson for policymakers and defense planners in the Department of Defense across the whole spectrum of strategic competition. So my first question is in regard to your research methodology. You state that you use a principal agent theory competitive analysis. Now, can you expound upon that for us? Yeah, uh, let me, I'll take that one. Uh, so this was actually something that kind of emerged from the empirical research um, that Diane and, and Hugh had started, where it became very clear that the story uh, that they were finding was rooted more in, um, as they were doing the comparative analysis, the principal agent story really came out as something that um, needed some explanation. It also was at the same time uh, that we were starting to feel some pains in eastern Syria with uh, the Turkish um, uh, umbrage against the, uh, the YPG and, and the SD, uh, Syrian Democratic Forces, the Kurdish Forces. So 
there needed to be something that helped us explore a little bit the idea of how we deal with proxies, both from our vantage point and how others deal with their proxies. Principal agent theory is something that's well established in social sciences. The basic idea, and it's frankly anything that you experience in bureaucracy. Um, the principal agent theory basically uh, is the, the problem where an, a thing, an entity, a person might uh, delegate responsibility to achieve some objective to another party. And in so doing loses absolute control over how things are done. So principal is the person who is sponsoring or has a desired effect. Uh, the agent is the entity or person to whom the responsibility is delegated. So you can imagine uh, to make it uh, very relatable in any office, uh, the leadership is the principal, the, the, the subordinates are the, are the agents, right? So principal agent uh, dilemma is readily experienced uh, by everyone in their daily lives. We just amplify that up. Uh, when you think about it strategically for um, international politics. The other component that uh, led into this is uh, we, we in the United States government and military especially assume government to be the state of nature, the natural condition. When you get into international relations, you start to realize that, well, actually the nation state is more the aberration and not the natural condition. And it's very hard to keep states together in some cases. So uh, we have to come up with ways of analyzing how um, external actors might influence or interfere with domestic politics in the constant recreation of things we call states. Principal agent theory provides at least a, a lens uh, through which this is possible. Okay. Diane, Hugh, did you have anything you want to add to Dave's uh, comments on question number one? Oh, no. He, Dave, you did a good job. <laughs> I think so. Okay. Well, <laughs> plenty of time for uh, further inputs. So my next question, let's try a little bit of, let's think from Tehran's perspective for a minute. So what does Tehran hope to gain by employing proxies in Iraq and Syria and Yemen from a grand strategic perspective? And, and what are the pitfalls for Iran for their involvement? Well, I can take that. Um, I think from a grand strategic uh, perspective, the Islamic Republic leaders are only interested in protecting their regime survival by employing these proxies in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. They seek to keep the U.S. and its allies' forces busy and overwhelmed through their own use of Iranian proxies to destabilize their rivals. Um, plus, uh, Tehran aims to distract Washington's focus away from regime change in Iran. Um, as you know, economic sanctions reached their maximum pressure point during the last administration. But interestingly enough, uh, the, you know, despite the, all the pressure from the maximum uh, pressure you know, strategy, uh, basically they survived. And uh, historically, uh, Iranian leaders, they take kind of pride in surviving these events. Uh, they, they think that they survived the Shah's you know, army, they survived the, you know, uh, Saddam's uh, invasion of Iran, they survived some of the military engagement during the 1980s and uh, nowadays with, you know, some of the, you know, engagement that they have with Israel. So they think that they're survivors. Um, so I think that's, that's a very important aspect, you know. Something else I should add is that, um, you know, we, of course, we all agree that Iranian <laughs> clerics are kind of incompetent in terms of running the national economy or dealing with the domestic corruption, because basically many of them are part of it, you know, um, and also moving the country toward, you know, some form of democracy. However, they are neither irrational or illogical as, you know, some people have assume and stereotype suggest, you know, they completely understand the limits of their military capability. Uh, in late 1980s, uh, there were some uh, uh, military incident in the Persian Gulf between the Iranian naval forces and the American battleship. And in a matter of, you know, hours, they lost 30% of their, um, you know, their, uh, you know, their uh, naval forces. So, and that had like imprinted in them, you know, a form of, you know, military inferiority. So they would never be interested in formally engaging the U.S. And that's what we were talking about. They keep the, you know, conflict in the gray zone. If I, yeah, Diane, please. Oh, no, go ahead. 
Uh, I was just going to add, you know, one of the things that uh, has popped out as a discussion point um, as a possibility in, in our applied research series that we've worked together is the idea that Iran actually has an interest, as I think he was indicating, maintaining some instability in uh, some of the neighboring countries because coherent states wind up being able to aggregate their national power towards, say, the Iranian regime. But while they are internally uh, disunited, it creates opportunity for two things. One, they can't assemble all their national power to marshal against the regime, but also it gives them the opportunity, as I think the monograph describes, uh, to penetrate into the institutions of state on occasion and uh, build allies uh, within the systems, even if they can't dominate entirely. I'm sorry, Diane, please. No, 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 no. Go. I'll jump in on the next question. Okay. All right, very good. So let's talk about your research questions. Uh, you go into a lot of detail um, about the theory of proxy conflict formed by the neo-realist school of thought in international relations. And then you cite several prominent thinkers in your publication from the school of thought. And you conclude by saying that by viewing Iran's relationship or viewing Iran's relationships with its proxies through the lens of Shia identity is a huge mistake. So do you propose that adopting a more nuanced view will allow defense planners an appreciation of the fissures and spaces that we can exploit to disrupt Iran's principal agent dilemma with their proxies to our strategic advantage? I do. Um, and I think Dave and Hugh set this up really well in their discussion, um, allowing me to, to provide a little bit more insight here. So, you know, I think that U.S. policymakers and, and the public writ large has a really difficult time seeing beyond some of the identity politics in the region. And, you know, one of those identities is religion. And, you know, any uh, individual that's looking at this region and is, is well versed in the region understands that there's a break between uh, the Sunni and the Shia. But if you allow that perspective to dominate how you look at the region, then you're going to miss some very, very key important facts about what is going on on the ground. And so the neorealist theory is nice because instead of looking at identity, the neorealists are really looking at power. It's the most important variable. And if you just look at how power is distributed and the desire for individuals, states, organizations to gain more and more power, you might see a few different things tease out. And I'll give you a key example of this. I think it's really hard to wrap, uh, to, to understand that, um, you know, I think it's easy to understand that, hey, look, uh, I, Iraq is divided along its Sunni and Shia lines, okay? And, and we understand that. And we understand that Iran is predominantly Shia. So it makes sense, you know, if you're using the identity lens that Iran is going to come in and form a lot of alliances and, and um, areas of opportunity to work with Shia politicians in Iraq. We understand that. But if you're only looking at things through this identity lens, you might miss out on some other key issues and, you know, or key uh, problems or, or areas of opportunity. So um, if you're only looking at that, you might miss the fact that Iran also works with Sunni groups when it suits them in terms of how they can gain more power. And it's not outside of the realm of possibility that Iran works hand in hand with groups like Al Qaeda groups like Islamic State, groups like any of this, the Sunni groups that have popped up in the region. So if you're only looking at this through the identity lens, you're going to completely miss all of that. And that is very, very important to understanding the region. Exactly. I, mean, I bring to mind the relationship between Iran and Hamas, Gaza Strip, classic example. Uh, they're more than willing to overcome their religious differences to fight a common enemy. So Excellent. Gary, um, if I could um, add one more point yeah. on that, and that's on the state building side. You know, my, my joke is that uh, there's no more dangerous tool in our toolbox than the, than the CIA World Factbook, mm -hmm. precisely for the reasons that Diane just mentioned. They only really deal on what are called primary socializations, religion, tribe, um, ethnicity, something along those lines. But when you start to do research on how you um, 
meld societies back together after conflict. It's what, what are called secondary socializations that transcend those primary socializations, which happen to have generally the most history of conflict. So in order to get people back together, working together, you have to emphasize uh, things like nationalism or uh, professional identities or something along those lines. One of our favorite examples was the Baghdad bikers. There's a motorcycle uh, group that was, hey, you could be a Sunni Shia Kurd, we don't care, just don't bring your politics, come and enjoy motorcycles, right? So that that kind of affinity group is actually some of the most important thing for things for stitching states back together. But if we start to look within each one of those identity layers, like Shiism, you start to realize there are factions within that macro, that larger identity structure. And that's where the politics tend to start to differentiate out. And in the case of this particular monograph, we're able to identify factions within Shiism that make Iran have potential problems with uh, proxies that we only from the Sunni Shia lens would find unproblematic. So it gives us some opportunities for us. I would like to add a, a couple of words to what my colleagues already mentioned. Um, I think they did a great job of you know, covering it. Um, yes, according to the Constitution of Islamic Republic, uh, the Islamic Republic is supposed to help Muslims around the world, not just in the, you know, in the region, anywhere in the world. And uh, of particular importance for Tehran is, of course, as a, you know, uh, as a place that is a Shia you know, uh, majority to help other Shia countries. However, I think, as my colleagues kind of directly and indirectly kind of uh, stated, uh, that doesn't guarantee, being a Muslim does not guarantee that you're going to get you know, support from Iran or being a Shia uh, certainly doesn't do. Um, one example, uh, think about the uh, you know, Azeri-Armenian uh, conflict, is that right? Uh, well, I mean, uh, Azerbaijan is the third largest Shia dominated country with 10 million. And this is following, you know, of course, Iran and Iran. Well, during the during the Nagorno-Karabakh, you know, war, you see that Iran actually kind of declaring what? Declaring neutrality. And in reality, Iran was a strategic ally of Armenia, a Christian country that technically in that conflict was what? Was actually the aggressor taking the land of the Azeris. And Azeris are majority Shia. Is that right? So uh, the idea that you know, I mean, thinking about it in just those simplistic terms of, oh, Shia is going to help Shia, Shia doesn't like Sunni, you know, Muslims are not going to get along with, you know, <laughs> uh, Christians, that, that's too simplistic, as uh, uh, my colleagues uh, kind of indicated as well. So that's why the issue is so complex. And that was one of the things that we wanted to actually discuss in this uh, book to uh, go a little bit deeper and, you know, try to provide all that information in a, a Easy reading, you know, I guess, uh, book for you know, for anyone. Yeah, hearing you guys delve into this topic and reveal the complexity reminds me of a couple of adages from a professor in graduate school. He said, "In his, when you're studying history, number one, context is king. And number two, the explanation that explains everything really explains nothing. So <laughs> you pretty well lent credence to that. Um, so let me move on." to Iran's war, proxy warfare strategy. Let's, let's peel the onion back a little more. So you state that Iran uses a strategy of divide and power control. That's one commonality we see among these three countries in proxy warfare. So let's expound on that. Sure, so, um, you know, I, I think a lot of us are very, very familiar with the divide and conquer or uh, you know, divide and rule policies. But when it comes right down to how this works in actuality, a lot of us are not as familiar. And I think actually for Americans who are upright people, it's very, very uncomfortable to think about how this is really done in actuality. So um, if you wanna look to history, you can look to um, Saddam Hussein you can look to Stalin. They were very, very good at divide and rule tactics. So how does this really work in actuality? Um, and it, it works very well. And you know, if you want to look at it on a very micro level, you might want to look at um, teenager, teenage girls or uh, people in your own family might use these tactics. Um, basically, what it is, is you know, if you are the um, 
proxy. Okay. You're the principal. You want to always stay. I'm sorry. If you are the country, if you're the principal, you always want to keep your proxies in line. You want to keep your agents in line. So in order to do that, you want to always come at um, situations from the point of superiority, meaning you always want to have some sort of leverage on your agents. Okay. Now, what is really key here is to always look for areas where you can um, maintain your control. So if you have an agent that is becoming too powerful, if you have a proxy that's becoming too powerful, okay, from, I think from, you know, the Western mindset or an American mindset, you know, we want to create a teams. So if we have um, a organization that's successful, that makes us good, look good as a leader. We want to have more and more a players. You have to look at this from a different perspective. You have to look at the B player who wants to always have C and D players working for them. Okay, so how do you do that? If you have a proxy, an agent that's becoming too powerful, you wanna make sure that you cut them down. So how do you do that? You identify individuals within that organization that are maybe subpar. You start to sow some seeds of dissent and then you incentivize them to create their own factions and prop them up. So, and when you're doing this whole exercise, you don't identify people within those organizations that are potentially amazing leaders. No, you identify toxic people, people that you can keep under control, people that you will, will always need you to be in charge. And so you don't want to identify people that are going to be able to maybe have their own agency or autonomy one day. No, you want to always have the um, perception of proliferating your organization while maintaining control of that organization. So this works really well. Um, dictators use this in order to always maintain control of the area and um, thwart any advances or thwart any potential rivals from rising up, uh, rising up and overthrowing them or um, creating um, um, uh, individuals that could eventually overthrow them, okay? So it always gives that principle that authority in every situation. It's a, based on what you're saying, I probably should have read your publication before I started raising teenagers. <laughs> oh, the teenagers. So I got my daughter to 20. <laughs> <laughs> you might see this in Mean Girls. So if you look at Mean Girls, um, if there's a Mean Girl group, there might be a head Mean Girl and Alpha who uh, might see right. other Mean Girls um, aligning and she'll find ways to sow dissent and split up those Mean Girls. Okay. It's the same thing, but it's just on a whole, uh, you know, macro level. And if I could. So, um, I uh, just one uh, one other point on um, sure. utility from a, a a sponsor's perspective. It's very unlikely in this kind of in a conflict environment you're going to cover all constituency groups with a single entity. Uh, so if you need to expand the number of constituency groups that are under your umbrella, using an approach like this actually has utility to try to harness as many different groups as, as possible. And I'd invite us to look at what we're experiencing in Eastern Syria as an example. Um, had to put our uh, efforts into the YPG PYD early on in Eastern Syria that has proved to be problematic over time, even with the Syrian Democratic Forces structure, because the Arab um, tribes in Eastern Syria still don't feel like they're adequately represented. But as long as things kind of maintain structure through the SDF process or the uh, program or uh, entity, it's very unlikely that you're going to ever really get to the constituency that is still feeling underrepresented in the system. So how do you, how do you think about building out beyond the one thing? And I think what we tend to do, at least in our world, is adapt our counterinsurgency or counterterrorism strategy. You have the government, everybody support the government. We have a proxy, everybody support the proxy. And that simply doesn't work in a lot of these environments, precisely because there isn't social trust broadly um, across the society. And that's what we described as uh, domestic anarchy. When you don't have trust within the society and amongst the different groups, they're not necessarily going to be comfortable with that one thing, uh, taking uh, ownership of their politics and their interests. Um, and so I think there might be a utility factor that, um, that goes into that strategy as well. Okay, th thanks, Dave. So let's talk about <clears throat> Iran's revolutionary or 
revisionist approach. What, what are Iran's foreign policy objectives within the strategic environment with Iran? Okay, I can say a few words about that. Um, I think, and of course, um, every country has their own unique aspects. But uh, in general, Iran, you know, revolutionary Iran, is just like any other revolutionary regime throughout the history. Um, uh, so in that regard, it, it's not necessarily unique. You know, I mean, um, I can give you a list of very fancy, you know, <laughs> um, you know uh, goals that they have set up. Uh, but in reality, I can summarize it in three basic uh, rules, which are actually the golden rules we usually borrow from the biological units. You know, any biological unit wants to survive uh, at any cost. Any biological unit wants to grow if the environment allows it. And every biological unit likes to reproduce or export its seed. Well, I mean, in that regard, uh, Iran is just like them, you know. Uh, now, notice that we keep emphasizing survive the regime. And the reason we talk so much about surviving the regime is because, you know, and this is something that we cannot take pictures of it from there. I mean, take a picture of their, you know, car, you know, license plate or something. You need to be there and talk to the people. There is a sense of insecurity among the leadership. I mean, with all the power that we assume they have, they're very, very insecure in terms of oh, what's going to be happening. And I was just thinking in terms of this, this has more, I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I mean, this has more of a psychological, you know, dimension than anything else. It kind of reminds me of uh, that line, famous line from the, the movie, that old movie, you know, uh, an officer and a gentleman. If you remember, Richard Gere was talking to his uh, drill sergeant who was pushing him to quit. And he said, I have nowhere to go. Now that really reminds me of the Iranian leadership right now. I mean, these people, they have really nowhere to go. That's why the regime has to survive. And they're not stupid. They realize what happens to people who have done things similar to them. You know, they know the history of what happened to Gaddafi and, you know, Ceausescu and Mussolini and everyone. And I think if in terms of, if there is gonna be a really a, a regime change in Iran, there is no place these people are gonna be welcome. Look. When you compare it to the Shah's regime, despite all those criticism of the Shah's regime, uh, a good part of the top leadership was, you know, uh, welcome to go to many other places, and they had a place to go. These people certainly do not have, don't have that. Now, when you get back to those three major goals we talked about, survival, growth, and, you know, exporting your seed. Well, we can say that despite all the mismanagement of the economy and everything else, they have somehow survived, okay? and they have actually grown, you know, but they certainly have not succeeded in the last goal, which is what exporting the revolution. There are some of the ideas here and there, but the closest one to them is the, the closest ally, Iraq. And as you can see, Iraqis, they have no stomach of establishing another Islamic Republic, Iranian style, that's for sure, you know? And uh, I'm sure Diane can tell you a little bit more about the details of it, but, you know, for example, think about even uh, people like Grand Ayatollah Sistani, who has actually an Iranian, you know, you know um, ethnicity. Uh, he meets with the Pope, but when some of the top Iranian officials come, he doesn't meet them. What would that tell you? You know, I mean, it's just like, you know. So I think, uh, you know, these are the aspects of the Iranian politics, a little fine aspect of it, I think you should emphasize that usually it doesn't get as much attention as usual. Okay, so um, Iran is the most is the largest, the most powerful Shia Islamic Republic in the world. Okay, that we've already established that it's readily apparent. You go into a lot of detail about how dynamic and complex and competing uh, the co the competitive nature of the sects and the variants within Shia Islam uh, that Iran is trying to manage. So, why is it so important for us to understand this complexity? within Shia Islamist planners? And how does it contribute to Iran's principal agent dilemma? Well, uh, it, it matters because a lot of the um, uh, sects or the, the variant variations within uh, Shia Islam are now in control or are part of the proxy um, coalition <laughs> that it's trying to cultivate. So it goes back to that, uh, the last comment Hugh had with uh, Ayatollah Sistani. Why in the world would one of the most preeminent Shia theologians and, and scholars uh, decide to meet with the Pope but not Iranian officials? 
Uh, the answer is because within one branch of the um, of Shiism called Twelver uh, Shiism, there are different interpretations of the role of what clerics are supposed to do. So Sistani's um, <coughs> tradition is that of guiding the population, right? So in, in educating and forming the population to live in a just way and from that just uh, way of life, a proper government will manifest. Uh, Iranian uh, version of Shia Islam is Adilia Faka, and which is basically that no, the clerics have to prescribe the right way to be or provide a backstop in the case of immoral legislation, which has essentially turned out to be very authoritarian, if not totalitarian, in consequence. <clears throat> so just within the one branch, you see very distinct political divisions, which are frankly the axis of Iraqi politics, which I'm sure Diane will discuss in, in a moment. Uh, mm -hmm. But beyond that, the other proxies that are by our CIA world fact, but Shia are Alawites and Zaydi, right? So the Alawites are very, very insular It um, until what, 1977, Hugh, or something along those lines, wasn't even sure that they were gonna consider it Muslim, uh, let alone Shia. Uh, and, and it is really a syncretic tradition, which is tribally insular. You have to be born into the Alawite community. So even though we see uh, Shia in, in Syria and Iran, the reality is, uh, the way the Alawites came to power is through secular Arab nationalism, which definitely ain't Persian, Iranian, Julia de Faka, right? <laughs> so, uh, and then within Yemen, it's a variant called Zaydi, um, is, uh, Zaydi Shiism, which uh, many scholars will describe it as some kind of, uh, somewhere in between a Sunni school of law or Shiism in some way, but the, a lot of the central tenets on the Mahdi and the 12th Imam, right, the 12th Imam. Um, don't necessarily hold in Zaydi Islam. And, and Diane Hugh, I invite you to correct uh, or amend or amplify anything I just mentioned. I'll just um, piggyback off of, you know, some of the points that you've made, Dave, uh, which are so good. Um, you know, when you're looking at legitimacy and legitimacy is really important as a policymaker, as an individual that has to go overseas and deal with politicians and people who is actually legitimate. And this comes up quite often. Um, I think sometimes from our Western point of view, we sense what is legitimate and uh, or, or we put a Western idea on what might be legitimate, but it's not necessarily what the majority of the people somewhere else thinks are legitimate. And so um, the interesting point about the division within the divisions really within Shia Islam, I'll talk about the two major ones, okay? So you've got um, the Najaf school of thought that's in Iraq, and then you've got a school of thought coming out of Qom in Iran. And the school of thought in Najaf, as Dave said, is really a bottom-up approach. So the bottom-up approach is, hey, good people make the state good, okay? Now in Iran, it's a, it's a, it's a flipped philosophy. And the philosophy, just very simply, is that the state makes people good. So it's top down. So the state has a lot, a huge role in making the state good. All right. So completely different. Now, this is something that if you're looking at the world from this principal agent perspective, this sort of neo-realist power dynamic, you can sense some agency slack. Okay. And the slack being, oh, wow, they're not completely in line with each other on this thought. And what's interesting from a Western standpoint and different people I've spoken with who actually know the region quite well, I asked them who would now, Qom or Najaf, you know, if you are a, a Shia Muslim or a Muslim in general, which one do you think is more legitimate in terms of, um, you know, the, you know, the, um, a, the ancient um, um, intelligence of the religion? Where does that lie? And most people say, well, I'm sure that's Iran. The, the answer is really, no, Najaf has antiquity behind it. Najaf is really the sort of focal point of most Shia around the world. And Sistani is sort of like the, you know, I hate to make equivalents like this, but he is more like a Pope than anyone in Iran. 
Okay, it's a completely different system for becoming a an Islamic scholar in Iran than it is coming out of Najaf. Okay, now Najaf is poor. Najaf might not have the same resources as Qom, but in terms of legitimacy, Najaf is quite legitimate. And you know, the Pope made a really good point in visiting Sistani. To me, that was a, a miracle in our time that Sistani would meet with the Christian pope the catholic pope this is highly unusual because he doesn't even meet with people from shia islam who are coming from iran so it sends a big message the message is okay iran's not really as legit we are true spiritual leaders i mean this is what i take out of it i'm a true spiritual leader this individual is a true spiritual leader there's a lot of history and a lot of intelligence coming out of our organizations that are um steeped with antiquity and you know, forget what's coming out of comb. Um, it's just not the same kind of legitimacy. That's what I took away from it. And I think that's what a lot of other people took away from it too. But that kind of gets lost in translation if you're just looking at this in terms of Shia versus Sunni or Christian versus Muslim. Okay, that was a very, very, very important event. And you know, the the legitimacy of Najaf is a great sticking point if you're an American policymaker looking to um, to exploit some of that agency slack between Iran and its proxies. Okay, so I think we've laid the groundwork for the strategic environment Iran is operating in, their objectives, uh, the, the nature of proxy warfare, and then the, the your research methods. So let's, let's delve in uh, more specifically, the, in the case of the three countries that you discuss in your publication, Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. So first off, in chapter two, you specifically address the case of Iranian proxies in Iraq. I think it's universally accepted today, in hindsight, our incursion into Iraq in 2003 to topple Hussein created strategic space for Iran. Uh, it was an unintended but unsurprising consequence. So what are Iran's interests in Iraq? And further, how do Iranian actions in Iraq reverberate beyond Shia religious significance to affect the geopolitics in Syria and Lebanon, uh, where Iran has been wielding influence for some time. Okay, I can say a few words about that. Well, okay. I think the current Iranian interest in Iraq has several dimensions. Of course, you know, there is the common history, there is the Shia religious, you know, ties between Tehran and Baghdad, you know, despite the differences, as I think Diane has done a nice job of describing it. Um, but uh, right now in Iraq, there are a lot of Iranian governmental and non-governmental organizations very, very active. And um, some of these, uh, you know, governmental organizations are connected to the Revolutionary Guard. Uh, now you might say, why? Well, because they are very active in the Iraqi economy uh, in a very indirect fashion. Um, one of the challenges we have had with the guard is, uh, you know, during the Ayatollah Khomeini's uh, period, um, he just generally speaking didn't trust any of the armed forces, including the Revolutionary Guard. So he kept all of the armed forces away from politics during his 10 years, the first 10 year of, uh, you know, uh, Iranian revolution. But when he passed away, I mean, he was a guy with a charisma, blah, 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 and then, you know, here comes one of his, uh, you know, students basically overnight, you know, kind of takes the position of the supreme leader. Uh, and uh, Ayatollah Khamenei is a very interesting person in terms of, very frankly, from well, based on what uh, Diane was telling us, he really doesn't have that ranking of a grand Ayatollah. You know, I mean, the Shia sect is very much like Catholic Church. You know, I mean, you just don't come from the bottom and suddenly show up you know, at the top. I mean, there are, of course, you know, in Catholic Church, we have the Pope, we have Cardinals, we have Bishops, we have everything. It's very, very hierarchical. Guess what? The Shia sect is very much organized like that. So technically, um, Ayatollah, you know, Khamenei was actually Sheikh al Islam, which is like two degrees less, you know, and he didn't have as much of a, you know, a followers and everything, you know, there are very, very few grand ayatollahs. And for the position of the supreme leader, you have to be a grand ayatollah. As my colleagues have already indicated, there have been a lot of 
you know, differences among the grand ayatollahs in terms of what is an Islamic Republic, what is the role of Islam in, you know, politics and so on and so forth, you see? So uh, when Ayatollah uh, Khamenei came to power, he basically loosened the hand of revolutionary guard. So no more political restriction on them, no more economic restriction on them. And these guys have been growing like crazy everywhere, all over the country. Um, and they have taken over a lot of businesses in Iran. Um, and now they're trying to do the same thing. Well, uh, you know, some people might say they've been successful. Some people say there are limits in Iraq as well. So Iraq, one of the other advantages Iraq has had for Iran is because Iraq, from our perspective, you know, is, a not, is a, supposed to be a role model. We have put, we invested so much time, energy, money, everything else in it, you know. Uh, has become a place for Iran to basically reduce the impact of the sanctions and in some cases neutralize it, you know? Uh, I mean, like a you know, money laundry area for Iran. Um, so, um, you know, so that, that's, that has been basically one of the challenges over there. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, our political and strategic, you know, aspect of it. And since uh, my colleagues, know more the language of the military. I'm going to leave that part of it to them. As I, I pass the floor in that regard. Hugh, that was so good. Um, you know, one thing I just want to mention is that economic aspect is, is really important because of the sanctions. And by getting uh, tentacles into Iraq and Syria and Lebanon and down into Yemen, you know, if you're looking at this on the globe, it makes a lot of sense from an economic standpoint, a supply chain standpoint, um, you know, to have strategic choke points, to control these border areas, areas where there is a lot of movement of um, cargo and shipments. So, you know, not all of it is for nefarious purposes. A lot of it is just simply for survival. And, you know, to caveat onto this, uh, and this is really important, when a regime is under such heavy sanctions, they're often looking for a very high return on investment items that they can, you know, when you can't just have your open exports, you can't just do your normal, okay, we're date trading and we can't do this, we can't do that. Well, how can we make the most bang for our buck? And if you're exporting things that have a high return on investment, you're looking at typically black market items, weapons, um, organs, unfortunately, people, um, you, money, things like that. And so, um, and it might even be cigarettes, but things that are um, very high return on investment for how much effort you're putting into it. And so you need people along the way, they're going to help facilitate that. And so that gives them the advantage of, okay, we know that we have a strong export line to Beirut. We know we have a strong export line, um, you know, into the ports of Syria. We've got a strong export line, um, you know, uh, uh, across the Bab al-Mandab. Um, and so, you know, and we, we know we can at least survive as a regime being under sanctions. And I'll just add uh, one of the last uh, elements for the internal uh, Iraq dimension. Um, as, as, Hugh had meant, as, as Hugh has mentioned many times, the, the, um, the cost of the Iran-Iraq war was just phenomenal in terms of Iranian lives. So maintaining a relatively weak or Iraq under con its control is its own strategic interest given the past conflicts. Um, so I don't think that can be under undersold. Uh, but the the importance of looking at the principal agent dilemma for the the secondary identities based on these different sec um, sub branches of Islam within Iraq are important because for many years we interpreted Ms. Uh, Muqtada al Sadr as a complete Iranian proxy. Or I completely controlled, but once you start to uh, differentiate between within 12 or uh, Shiism, the differences between the Sistani side and the Khamenei side or Khomeini side, you realize that Sadr, from a theological perspective, tends to be more on the Sistani end of the spectrum, not the Khomeini Khamenei side of the spectrum. So that winds up, as Diane was talking about, with a significant, significant degree of agency slack. Ironically, when he was uh, in the process of winning his election, uh, or his bloc was winning the election in 2018, we were a little bit beside ourselves in the U.S. government saying, oh my goodness, our guy in, in Baghdad is possibly going to lose to Sadr. Well, the guy in Baghdad was actually much more closely aligned with the Khomeini Khamenei side than it was the Sistani side. So we were, in effect, because we were only looking at it 
or mainly looking at it through Sunni Shia, we were looking at our Shia versus not our Shia, and our Shia was actually most aligned with Iran. The ironies there are extraordinary. And if we don't understand or have a deep appreciation of these uh, internal <clears throat> dynamics, we are li liable to make significant policy mistakes that frankly contributed to the rise of ISIS in the first place. I think my colleagues have done a great job of really describing all the fine aspects of the Iran's interest in Iran. But if you are looking for one sentence summarizing everything we told you in a <laughs> theoretical format, we can say that for Iran, Iraq has both instrumental and intrinsic value. Instrumental in terms of how Iran can use Iraq for its own benefits and intrinsic in terms of other aspects beyond being uh, beyond. All right, so we covered Iraq pretty thoroughly. Let's talk about Syria. So in chapter three, you discussed the proxy situation in Syria and how different it is from Iraq. So in particular, I find it interesting that despite the Assad regime battling for control of Syria, being firmly Alawite, and that's a heretical sect for most Shia Muslims, Tehran considers it crucial that the regime, the Assad regime remain intact. So how does the Assad regime serve Iran's grand strategic purposes? And could, could this religious gap potentially imperil the agent proxy relationship between Iran and Syria? Okay, well, I can, I can start. And then, um, as you know, Iraq is providing Iran with actually a land bridge. Land bridge toward what? As my colleagues have already indicated, a land bridge toward <clears throat> Eastern Mediterranean. Iranians are aware of, you know, um, the weaknesses of their situation as well. I mean, uh, not only in terms of the Middle East are trying to expand their influence in other regions. I think Diane did a great job of, you know, highlighting uh, Iranian connection to the Syrian and Lebanese courts and also in Yemen area. But you can see it in other sub-regions too. You know, Iran has had a connection with Georgia, you know, and ha Iran actually has a consulate in Batumi, the main port of Georgia in the Black Sea, just in case, you know. So, so they're thinking very strategically in that regard. So what is then the value of Syria for Iran? Well, again, you know, it has a geostrategic, you know, uh, you know uh, value. Uh, plus it has become basically a playground for this proxy war between Iran and Israel, you know. Uh, Iran <clears throat> takes only Israel as the, you know, as the serious, you know, rival in the region. They, you know, I mean, they think that as soon as we Americans pull away from, you know, Saudi Arabia, the Saudis cannot even repair any of their stuff. You know, they have to, you know, bring foreigners to fix this and fix that and on their own. The only rival they take seriously is Israel. And for a while, they were trying to like keep up with the Joneses, you know, Israelis mm -hmm. are launching, a, you know, uh, what you call it, a satellite, Iranians are launching a satellite. Of course, there was a quality difference, you know, the Israeli satellite is still going and working and the Iranian ones with the short term, you know, battery that is running around, but it's not doing anything anymore, you know. So, I mean, there are situations like that. Um, however, it, you see that in this proxy war between Tel Aviv and Tehran, they're trying their instruments of war against each other. They're playing against this and that. And um, so Iran in that regard has been able to project its power and try to show a leadership in the Muslim community. That has a lot of value. It's going, it's bidding for leadership. Now, uh, I would say that in that regard, uh, you know, Iran has been actually more successful, believe it or not, in the Syrian Lebanese area, as opposed to in the Persian Gulf area. Uh, because when you look at, for example, the Tel Aviv Tehran, you know, relationship over time, 45 years ago, uh, under the Shah, Iran and, you know, Israel, they had a great relationship. But still, the Shah of Iran, as a Muslim, so called Muslim leader, whatever that means, is that right, was not able to bring the other Muslim countries closer to the Israeli position. Interestingly enough, because of the fear of the growing power of Islamic Republic, you know, the liberal, you know, conservative, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, Arab states in the Persian Gulf, they've all kind of, you know, started a new relationship, you know, either under Ibrahim Accord or officially or unofficially with Israel. So uh, I guess the silver lining right here is that the fear of Iran has in a way contributed to improving 
the Arab-Israeli relationship. And I think that's interesting. You know, this is something that didn't happen before. You know, it's all because of the fear of Iran, but, you know, it has somehow contributed to, to that aspect. And I think that's very important. I, you know, I just want to, that, that was, um, that was perfect. Um, there, there's one little caveat I want to add about the Assad regime. So um, as our, you know, as everyone's mentioned, they are Alawiti. It's, it's a minority sect within Islam. Um, but if you are looking at uh, countries that are looking to have control, okay? So uh, a country like Iran, a country like Russia, um, even in the past, countries like uh, France and Great Britain played this game really well. So they would go into places and, you know, establish trading posts, establish um, uh, economies. When they went into places and they knew that they wanted to control the governance, they never would empower a majority faction. That would be um, very, very um, uh, detrimental to their goals. And so if you are playing the imperial politics, which I think as Americans, we're uncomfortable talking about this, but if you want to play imperial politics, you never empower a majority faction because the majority doesn't need you. You empower a minority faction because the minority faction cannot rule a country without help. They need arms, they need weapons, they need intelligence. And oh, by the way, they're very much outnumbered by the majority. So if you're gonna play imperial politics, you definitely wanna keep minority factions in charge. So the Alawiti regime in Syria is perfect for that. If you're Iran, if you're Russia looking at that and you know that you have a stakehold in that country, you know you have to keep your ports, you know you wanna have that access to the Mediterranean, you definitely want Assad because he can't hold that country without you. So you want him in charge and you want him to be your puppet. And that's exactly what they're doing there. And just to add on to the, um, the potential problem with the Alawite versus um, uh, Iranian version of uh, Shiism, I, the, the strategic value uh, is obviously also within light of having Hezbollah, which was a, formed based on an internal domestic anarchy, right? The collapse of the Lebanese state in the mid 70s. Um, for the Shiite population, the uh, formation of Hezbollah was a reaction to uh, the Israelis being there. So there became a logic of that connection between Iran and uh, the Lebanese Hezbollah in, in southern Lebanon for obvious reasons. And that, that has expanded out um, tremendously since that time. But Damascus International Airport was one of the main uh, ways for Iran to support Hezbollah for decades. So if um, the Assad regime had fallen in 2011 or 2012, uh, which there was a real chance that it might have done so in 2012 or 2013, uh, had, that, had it lost Damascus, it would have had a very difficult time providing support to Hezbollah and its strategic position vis-a-vis -vis Israel would have been tremendously weakened. As it turns out, by being able to co-opt the Iraqi state, again, unfortunately with our support in some cases, uh, it was able to actually create a land bridge when the Assad regime uh, fell. It was able to reestablish that land bridge using um, not indigenous Shia populations, there just weren't that many. They actually had to import Shia to fight for the cause. And, and those forces were formed from um, Hazara out of Afghanistan and Baloch out of Pakistan, dominantly and other Shia in, in Pakistan. Uh, but uh, this is one of those interesting cases. They did need to expand the number of proxies in Syria. They just couldn't generate enough forces within the Alawite and the indigenous um, non-Alawite Shia populations. So in order to generate stronger influence, they had to bring in proxy forces from other countries in order to do that. And what has effectively happened is the Assad regime as a secular Arab nationalist regime really has no interest in being dominated by a theocratic Iranian regime. They used to be co-equals in their support of Hezbollah. Now it is its own agent in a way because it is so dependent on the Iranian government. Um, it's, so there is a high probability that the Assad regime over time would want to reestablish its own independence and autonomy based on those theological and, and frankly, secular differences um, in, in how they have to approach government. 
Uh, so the, the most likely sponsors or principles that to which the Assad regime could turn would be obviously Russia, longstanding relationship, but increasingly China, just because of the amount of dollars that it's willing to invest in um, countries that go against the, <laughs> the established international order. Um, so I think what Iran is probably doing, and you're seeing this across main uh, ground lines of communication, is they're implanting these foreign proxies along uh, the GLOCs, and those could serve Iran's interests because they have no indigenous bases of support. They just don't. So who are they going to turn to um, if they may decide to stay there? So this is the evolving uh, system of influence. We don't know exactly how that's going to play out. Uh, but you can imagine that the Assad regime, for practical purposes, would be interested in the long term in maintaining that subordinate position in the system. Hence, agency slack. <laughs> and adding a few words to what uh, already David uh, beautifully described in terms of uh, the Iran connection to Hezbollah and uh, the role of Hezbollah in that geostrategic area. I must, I must say that not only Hezbollah provides Iran with the opportunity to project its power uh, from north to, uh, to Israel, uh, but also get involved more and more in the Lebanese politics. Uh, as you know, you know uh, Hezbollah has played a very significant role, obviously, over there, has been considered uh, through its uh, in military engagement with Israel as kind of sometimes a, a national heroes and this and that and everything else. But, it is also another thing about the role of Hezbollah, and that is uh, uh, Iranian leaders, they notice that every time they want to establish a proxy group in Arab countries, they're better subcontract the Hezbollah because these are Arabic speaking, you know, <laughs> Shiites that they can connect much better with the Yemenis and the Syrians or the this and that and all over the Arab world, as opposed to Persian speaking revolutionary guard that they have a top down approach, you know, with, hey, we are superior to everybody. So, I mean, uh, in that regard, I think Hezbollah has played also a very important role for Iran. And, and you, if I could ask uh, you um, a follow-up question on that is uh, within Lebanon this year, we tend to think of uh, Lebanon as Sunni Shia Christian, uh, but within Lebanon, there is also that intra 12 competition between the Sistani side and the Khomeini side. Um, is, that, is that fair? Yes, I would say so. And so if we're looking at agencies like or the potential for a new Lebanese coalition, how do you think about that division with Sistani's network, which is robust across Lebanon, working with other entities within mm -hmm. the um, Lebanese state, along with a growing nationalist youth movement that seems to be taking place in both Lebanon and Iraq? And to what extent those social movements offer opportunities with different uh, variations of um, Shia and other communities? That's an interesting question that probably deserves more research. Yeah, if I could make an observation, recalling my studies of the Roman Empire and uh, in the Cold War, you know, Cold War turning the entire world to a gigantic chessboard between the Soviet Union and America, you look at agent proxy relationships similar to the client state patron relationships, those puppets got pretty good at, we at pulling the strings of their puppet masters. So oftentimes it made you wonder who are the real masters, the puppets or the puppet masters. So uh, you, you brought yeah. that out. Discussions about yeah, so there is a phenomenon that uh, that agents have the ability to, to principal shop, right? Yeah. So who's, who's my better principal? I don't like this one too, too demanding on me. Who can I turn to maintain right. myself and gain some autonomy? That's um, you can see that. Yeah, I think in any of the three cases that there's a potential for that. If, if you, have a different operating environment. Yeah, interesting. So um, we're going to address this next question about Yemen. And then we have a couple of questions from our Q&A from the audience uh, that I'd like to, to go into. And we're doing great on time, by the way, guys. We're right at the hour mark. So we'd like to shoot for another half hour. So we're doing really good on time. Uh, and we're going pretty deep into these questions. Uh, so well, we the next question is about- We want to leave actually some time for the questions too. I think we all- appreciate having questions because it gets us thinking, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> about the next project or something. So that would be, no, you know, tossing some softballs, you guys. So I want, I want you to, I want you to be light on your feet here and, and stay on your toes. So yeah. that's how it sharpens you as academics, right? Sharpen that acumen you have as academics and those troublesome students you have to deal with. So let's talk about Iran's tenuous relationship 
with the Houthi, uh, did I pronounce that correctly? Houthi yes. movement in Yemen. And as, you ascribe it mostly to the profound theological differences within Yemeni Shia. They go against Iran's version of 12 or Shiism. And this is a good uh, segue to your comments earlier about the complicated variants within Shia Islam uh, that you know, a lot of Westerners aren't aware of. So if so, what are, the, what are Iran's goals in supporting the Houthis? And what are the US interests in thwarting this relationship? So it's, uh, again, trying try not to retread, but the idea between Fiber Shiism and, and Twelver Shiism is pretty profound, especially when you get into what the role of the cleric is, especially in government. So um, the Fiber Shia aren't even necessarily attached or are not attached to the idea of the Twelfth Imam, uh, which is the foundation of Twelver Shiism. And they certainly are not attached to the idea that the clerics have a uh, higher standing, as Diane was saying, with the top-down ordering of morality within society. So just within that concept alone, it's hard to imagine that the Zaydis would say, you know what, I really want to be a very tight prince of, uh, agent to the Iranian principle. Um, it just doesn't seem to, to flow right. So you can imagine that they might need one another due to the domestic anarchy that um, that the Houthis are feeling with inside Yemen, obviously Iran has, as Diane and you have been saying, strategic interests in the waterways and a southern approach to Israel, but also a second front on Saudi Arabia. It's essentially addition by subtraction. I'm able to weaken my adversary by focus, forcing them to focus on multiple fronts. Um, and, and so Yemen as a destabilized uh, entity is, is within their interest, especially if they can launch rockets from down there. <laughs> It creates a whole bunch of strategic options and, and um, costs on the adversaries. But uh, even within Zaydi Shiism, the Houthi movement is a minority. There are, um, there are secular Zaydis. There are different ways to practice Zaydism. So um, within, within that political structure of what, what we know to be Yemen, there are different uh, identity layers. Zaydi is just one of them. So to, to gloss it over as Sunni versus Shia, this is a tremendous amount of variation within Zaydism. And it certainly doesn't deal at all with the other complicating identities such as tribe, or now again, another kind of youth movement that is not necessarily attached to either of those things. So, or as deeply as before. So there are identity layers that if we look at those secondary socializations that could provide for a much better sense of political um, accommodation than if we just focus on Sunni Shia. But as long as we continue the conflict that domestic anarchy kind of creates its own logic of Sunni versus Shia, West versus Iran. And that just is not productive in terms of how you actually eliminate them as a sponsor. And I'd like to add something else to what they've already so beautifully described about, uh, about Yemen. One of the other factors from the Iranian perspective, or Tehran's perspective, is the rewarding loyalty. You know, uh, Iran established all these connections in Yemen. Uh, we could say actually the same thing. We can see the same thing about Syria. You know, this is something we didn't actually mention earlier. But uh, why is Syria so important to Iran? You know why? because the Syrian regime was the only Arab state that during the Iran-Iraq war supported Iran. The Tehran leaders, they have never forgotten about that. And they always value that. And the same type of reward that they have for you know, Assad regime goes all the way back to that. Same situation we see uh, as um, you know, um, They've already described it uh, with certain groups in, you know, despite all the differences, you know, uh, in Yemen. So I wanted to add that one in terms of one of the interesting characteristics that the Tehran regime is showing. Yeah, you know, um, Iran's involvement in Yemen gives them an opportunity to push against a status quo. And so it, it pits Saudi Arabia as the, um, uh, as holding up the status quo and it pits Iran as pushing against the status quo. So it fits their narrative. It's in a great strategic location for them. And oh, by the way, the Houthis 
they faced a lot of interesting um, challenges with regards to Saudi Arabia in the past. So the Saudis would go into that area and mm -hmm. do kind of like um, kind of like missions, but you know, the sort of the Islamic version of setting up mosques and doing um, charity work, kind of like how Christians go around the world and, and spread the gospel. It was very similar, but I think the Houthis didn't appreciate that very much. And they would push back on that. The tribes people thought, you know, didn't want the, the Saudis coming into their region. And Iran was able to play off of that pretty well and, you know, kind of co-opt uh themselves as hey look we'll help you push push that out of your region and so knowing understanding that dynamic i think is really really important when you're looking at the individuals and the people involved in this conflict why they would pick a certain side versus another a lot of it goes back decades and, and centuries even but even you know within living memory there's been a lot of antagonism isn't Diane, you know, very diplomatic, you know, the, she says the, the Houthis, they didn't appreciate. You know? They didn't appreciate. <laughs> so, I mean, she should make it you know, an ambassador for sure. Uh, I would say, go further and I would say that not only they didn't appreciate, they hated the guts of the Wahhabi and the Saudis running around in their neighborhood and trying to get their kids to act, you know, and become like members of Al Qaeda or whatever and this and that. So no, they didn't appreciate. And you know, uh, Yemen has an advantage, as uh, you know, uh, in a way, Diane already mentioned uh, for Iran that it's like it not not just a strategic aspect, but it's like a thorn in the back of Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Because usually, when we think about Iranian-Saudi rivalry, we focus on the Persian Gulf side, especially the Dahran area of Saudi Arabia, which is the oil area, and that's where we have seen other activities. Because Dahran area not only has oil, it's also concentrated by the Shiites. Interesting, isn't it? So, so here we go. So we see, for example, you know, some of the bombing of the, you know, uh, the towers and this and that, or missile, you know, activities has been in that area. So here we go. They are opening like another front, you know, uh, to kind of put a little bit more pressure on Riyadh. And here we go after, you know, four years of having support from the previous administration, the crown prince, with all those horrible things that he has said about the Iranian leadership, he seems to be ready to talk, you know, I mean, you know, it seems like, here we go, these uh, leaders in the Middle East, they come and go, and then, you know, leaders in the West, they come and go, and these uh, incompetent, uh, basically, for lack of a better term, you know, incompetent uh, ayatollahs and mullahs in Iran, they seem to be sticking pretty, you know, tight in their position. All right, so we have addressed the three main proxies you, you discuss in your publication. We're gonna move on to some questions in, uh, from our audience. Um, I think we discussed this, uh, uh, approach just a little scantily before, but can you talk about the insights on principal agent relations with Lebanese, Hezbollah, Hamas, and Palestinian Islamic Jihad? So obviously, Lebanese Hezbollah any... has generated quite a degree of um, indigenous power base. So um, the degree of proxy, one of the things we, we talked about is there's no real clear line from the point you become, you cross from an autonomous actor into being a full-fledged proxy. There's kind of degrees of freedom. Um, and that's that's a little bit of uh, spitballing, you know, exactly the the degree of proxiness that any organization has. But if you look at the characteristics that allow Lebanese Hezbollah, Le Lebanese Hezbollah to prosper, they've actually generated quite a bit of indigenous support, the ability to extract taxes and revenue. Um, and so as a proxy, it is one of the more autonomous uh, actors that you would see out there. Um, the Hamas and Palestine, Palestinian Islamic Shahad from my understanding, and it's very limited, probably have less resources to sustain themselves uh, independently just by the nature of the Gaza Strip and what it can accrue as resources. So my guess is that you would see a higher degree of autonomy or agency slack possible out of Hezbollah than what you would find out of Hamas or PIJ. But uh, Diane, do you would- I, I, Yeah, I, you know, I, I think- learn. Um, Hezbollah is just the model of how Iran does this. 
And, you know, you look to Hezbollah and you can really see, you know, the sort of maturity of what a proxy can hope to become. And even Hamas, to a lesser extent, is really what Iran wants to seed across the region. And it's unfortunate if you look at areas where um, these proxies have become very mature, it's not necessarily that these countries are doing well. And so you kind of have to wonder, well, what in folks kind of wake up and say, hey, look, uh, the maturity of these organizations, um, it, you know, is great, but wow, the areas that they serve are not doing so well. Um, I think that it's, you know, it's interesting if you look back at the history of Tehran's relationship with Tel Aviv, the antagonism really started after the fall of the Shah and the implementation of the new regime. And so this whole antagonism towards the Israeli state, I mean, Iran really, really leveraged that situation to their benefit. And it created the, a narrative for them. It created a way to export you know, the religious ideology. It created a way for them to export their revolution. And it gave them an impetus to become a little bit more um, revisionist, um, uh, expansionary. And so, you know, it, I look to that moment as, as very, very um, interesting in history. So we're talking like 79. So it's really been a 40 year issue. And you know, Hezbollah is the example of what Iran can do across the region. Okay. And, and if you want to know what Iraq is going to look like, what Yemen's going to look like, what Syria is going to look like, you just look at Lebanon and you look at the Gaza Strip. That's what it's going to look like. And let me add something to that in that regard. Uh, we are talking about how practical sometimes these, uh, you know, uh, Iranian uh, cleric are. Uh, Yes, uh, Diane is right. And basically after uh, the demise of the Russian uh, system, I mean, the Shah system, basically they started this animosity more and more toward Israel, but Israel didn't right away give up on Iran. You know, right when Iran, Iraq war started, Israelis, they came, you know, they flew a couple of C-30s, you know, they brought chains for Iranian tanks and tires for Iranian planes and everything because they simply didn't want Iran in a matter of four or five days to be defeated by Saddam Hussein. So, I mean, uh, it's not a love and loss situation. It was just a strategic thinking. So they didn't completely lose thought in that. But, you know, in terms of Hezbollah and what Hezbollah has served Iran uh, in that region of the world, you know, it was a very small investment for them. You know, in 1982, when the Israelis, they went to Lebanon and they basically, you know, during the war, they destroyed some of the infrastructure and everything, you know, the, the first group of people who really suffer were the Shiites because the southern part of Lebanon are mostly Shiite farmers, you know. So uh, the Palestinians from Beirut were coming down, they were shooting a couple of rockets into Israel and, you know, you don't joke with the Israelis, you, you know, you do something to them, they come back and slap you on the right and left and, you know, kick you in the back and everything else. You make sure that you don't forget it, you know. So when they would come back to do these things, who would suffer? The Shiites would suffer. So at the beginning, when the Israelis came right into, you know, Lebanon, the Shiite farmers were actually happy because they knew that there's going to be some sense of, you know, stability and everything and they're not going to be uh, hit so bad. But the infrastructure was gone and Khomeini sent, uh, you know, his emissaries with $2 million and they basically established a grassroots organization that was focused mostly on providing local, you know, services and here we go, you know, so many years later, we have Hezbollah, obviously, as a result of it. It has been one of the best investments that Iran has done. And one of the interesting aspects of it is when they do stuff like that, they're kind of different from us Americans. You know, we sometimes try things. Let's try this one and see what happens. And I think maybe Yoda in Star Wars was right when he was telling Skywalker, you know, he said, don't try. You do or you don't do, you know, don't try. So in that regard, that just doing you know for iran has worked and just trying for us maybe has not been as fruitful so maybe you should think about what yoda says a little yeah hearing your comments that it, it brings to mind the another element of the complexity of the agent uh proxy relationship they want the proxy to be strong enough to execute their bidding uh, but not so strong that they can stray away uh from their strategic objectives and become autonomous. So that's a fine line Iran has to walk uh, in the case of Hezbollah. Um, so next question addresses Afghanistan. So the question is, in the, on the eve of America's pullout from Afghanistan, can we see it as a chance for Iran 
to use the strategic space to grow new sex to be used in the subcontinent to stretch its fatal arms. <clears throat> Well, I think, you know, I can start by saying that um, maybe Iranian leaders have been complaining a whole lot about our politics since the revolution, but no matter what we have done to them in the last, I don't know, four and a half decades, they should be appreciative of what we did for them by getting rid of two of their natural enemies, you know, the Taliban in Afghanistan and, of course, Saddam Hussein in, in Iraq, because they certainly would do it power vacuum right there, they certainly have increased their influence both on Eastern side and on the Western side. So in that regard, I think there are among the parties that they're gonna be gaining more influence. Yeah, of course their influence is not unlimited. It's basically with the Dari speaking people, with the Shiite, the Khazaris and everything in Afghanistan. Um, but they certainly would have more opportunity to fill some of the vacuum provided by uh, the departure of some of our forces. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, um, set this up for Dave to fill in, but I think this is actually a great segue, a great question to segue into the great power politics, the great power competition, because as you see the US forces leave Afghanistan, I predict you're gonna see Iran come in to a certain extent, but I think you'll see China actually come in to a big extent. I also have been noticing across the region um, lots of overtures to the Chinese and overtures by the Chinese. Uh, for instance, I think I, I read that there's a couple major oil companies selling their shares in um, Iraqi oil fields. They've been there for decades, but they're going to go ahead and, and pivot out. And who's going to come in China? So if anything, you know, looking at this from a uh, neo-realist lens or even um, um, a realist lens, I would predict that China will come in in a big way as the US departs from the region. And I would anticipate that's an opportunity or um, it sets up China to actually be involved in some conflict there. I'm not sure how they will mitigate some of the issues um, that, you know, I don't, I don't know that they can mitigate it better than we can, but I would predict that there's gonna be some conflict there. Um, and maybe that could work to our advantage uh, depending on how uh, how nefarious or uh, duplicitous we want to be, but I think um, that might be a win for us in some ways. But definitely, I foresee China coming in. I don't know, Dave. <laughs> uh, my first comment is going to be on Afghanistan itself, and that is an example of I think why we wanted to do this monograph because it honestly, at least in my my Dave's opinion only, um, we failed in understanding our own. What, we, what eventually became kind of our proxies, we failed. We had to use who was available at the time. And frankly, a lot of those people were the exact ones that made the Taliban look like a good option in the first place back in 1993. We were not honest with ourselves that we could not form a government around those actors and individuals because they were gonna to revert to form and they did. So uh, what we are looking at in Eastern Syria is effectively what we did in Afghanistan. We empowered a group or a single entity, highly imperfect from a strategic perspective. And we did not look around at what other constituencies that could be activated um, in order to create a countervailing system of constituencies that would over time dilute the negative aspects of the proxies we had to work with at the time and build out over time a much stronger system of politics that was representative of the whole of society. And it's not necessarily the same thing as what we're describing in the divide and power control that Iran is using, but it is a nurture network mentality. We have to be realistic of who we have to work with at the time of entry, but then build out something that is much more representative of the different constituencies, which we will never be able to interpret if we rely solely on those primary socializations. This is our failure as a country this is why I don't necessarily disagree with the idea of withdrawing from Afghanistan because we're doing the same old, same old, same old, and we were never gonna have success. Now, could we have success? Absolutely, but not if we continue doing the same old, same old. So if we're looking at what we need to do in terms of strategic competition, um, and that's I think part of the motivation for um, commissioning this monograph is we have to have a much better sense of 
the on the ground secondary socializations um, that become necessary in terms of how do we plan for and engage populations based on who we have at the time, but who needs to be cultivated in order to be more um, productive in a long-term medium, the long-term political sense. That's where we're falling down. If China decides to enter into Afghanistan, oh my goodness, I cannot imagine the pain that they're going to feel under a Taliban regime, especially given what's happening across the border in Xinjiang, right? it's a tiny border, but it's a border uh, with the Uyghurs. I, I just cannot imagine them being willing to come in in any significant degree. And if they do, I'm okay with that. I think um, that will be a, a cost that I would like to see them bear. Um, if uh, we're looking at places like Iraq, I'm a little bit more circumspect. I think we're finally starting to see the political winds change in um, Iraq that are favorable to the United States. There is a, a I don't want to say counter Iran, but there is a real significant pushback on the degree of Iranian influence in Iraqi politics that crosses the 12 or Sistani side of the 12 ers through the Sunnis, across to the Kurds, and then across a nationalist view to whatever extent that is gelling. Um, and to pass that off to China at this point, I'm not necessarily sure that would be a good geostrategic um, option for the United States, but if it happens, we'll see how they behave. I can say that the reputation in other areas has been less than stellar based on a heavy hand and a lack of uh, social cultural appreciation. So while we may have our own gaps, my understanding, or at least what I've heard anecdotally is that China's degree is worse. So I think that winds up creating the opportunity for positive opportunities for us, but we have to be sensitive to what those might be in the first place. And I'll stop there. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, when these groups go principal shopping, it's nice to have an alternative, and then you can point out the alternative, hey, maybe it's not better than what you already got. All right, so we are coming up on time, and we have one more question I'd like to um, address to all three of you about tying everything together. So the what if. Or the, or I'm sorry, the so what? So what are the policy implications of your research? Are there any lessons we can apply to the emerging definition of strategic competition in the interim national security strategy about proxy warfare that, that seek to build upon the previous administration's uh, pivot to break power competition? I think, um, uh, if you don't mind guys, I'll, I'll start off on this one. Uh, the, the problem we're having with counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, to me, is not differentiated from strategic competition in any way, shape, or form. A lot of the environments where we're having to conduct um, counterinsurgency, counterterrorism operations, are ones that have a natural domestic anarchy. There is a security vacuum within the societies, and so the idea of potential conflict is, is front and center for a lot of folks. If, you, if we have the ability to dissect why um, that demand, domestic anarchy exists, don't necessarily assume that the government is a positive actor per doctrine. Doctrine is frankly wrong on this, um, but look at what are the, the different potential political groupings that um, could align in a potential conflict. That's when you will start to see where the, the, the breakdown for external actors on the proxies comes in. And I think we can look at this across the Sahel and Sahara very, very easily, take these insights. Um, but also if, you, if, you, if we start to engage populations on their terms, take a human security perspective, see the world through their eyes, then how you engage to mitigate or off ramp the trend towards violence is not substantially different than the reputation effect we want to achieve with strategic competition. We want to be the attractive alternative. If we're going around having to deal with counterterrorism operations and we're not in specifically using counterterrorism operations to create the white space for non-kinetic or, or uh, population engagement, then we're not doing CT right. And I think that is something that we have to be honest with ourselves about. So if we look at them as conjoined, the behaviors are di aren't different. Um, and so we can take the idea of principal agent analysis and apply it to what networks 
do we have to construct what agents are available on the ground for a positive social engagement and to move the population away from the violence or towards us as an attraction in the strategic competition? Um, I think um, one of the lessons I came up with as, as we were writing this and as we're pivoting to great power competition is just how important the cognitive domain of warfare is and how you set that, you know, and you can call it a lot of different things, you know, psychological operations or um, now it's MISO, um, it, but it's really this cognitive domain and controlling the narrative that's out there, controlling um, the words that you're putting out there to influence other people. And I think sometimes um, there's more uh, pushback to put out ideas than there is to do some kinetic operations. And I find that quite baffling, but you know, I think it's really important to understand um, uh, the thought processes, the backgrounds, you know, these nuances. But once you understand that, you know, you can have a lot of leverage and a lot of influence in that cognitive domain. And, and you, can, you can set yourself up nicely to, uh, to really influence how, um, how things play out. But I think, it's, I think we're underutilizing that domain. And, and that's something I sort of, uh, as a concluding thought, that, that's sort of what I thought. I don't know, Hugh? Well, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank my colleagues because I think they, they did a great job of summarizing everything. I like to put uh, the emphasis on the final product. Uh, yes, we are academicians. Academicians have a tendency to talk about a lot of theoretical and conceptual ideas and then take pride in their wonderful methodology. And we did a little bit of that, but if you look very carefully, I'd like to encourage the audience to take a look at it. It's very readable, you know? We didn't just sit over there and discuss some obscure theoretical or conceptual issue or methodological aspects. We really connected the, the theory and concept to the policy and practical aspect. I think in that regard, of course I'm biased, you know, <laughs> I think in that regard our uh, you know, monograph is very balanced between borrowing some uh, theoretical ideas, looking at some uh, simple you know, methodological aspect and then really talking about what does it mean in practice? Um, you know, we identified what the problem is. We came up with some ideas. And I think we also proposed some question over there, some food for thought, you know? So I would really like to uh, encourage the audience to take a look at it. Uh, it's not very long and uh, you know, short, you know, little uh, chapters, depending on what your interest is. You wanna focus on Syria, Yemen, you know, et cetera. Um, but um, I think you would uh, find it helpful, hopefully, uh, you know, some, some you know, we would find it to be thought provoking. And we really do appreciate the opportunity to present our findings and some of our thoughts with, with the audience. Thanks to um, John and Carrie. Carrie, thank you so much for what you've done. No, I have thoroughly enjoyed this discussion. I found it very enlightening. So Dr. Ellis, Dr. Sadri, Dr. Zori, thanks for joining us today to discuss your publication about Iranian proxies. Thank you so much for having us. It was an honor and thank you to the audience for coming. It means a lot. And I Absolutely. hope that you learned something new. Thank Absolutely. you very much, everybody. Absolutely. Thank you very yeah. much. I would add, we had very robust participation today. One of our, <laughs> one of our record turnouts for audience participation. So a lot of people registered. So uh, Diane, Dr. Sadri, Dr. Dr. Ellis, thanks again, your research. Your findings, very timely, very relevant. I personally found them very thought provoking. Uh, you challenged a lot of the preconceived notions I had about Iran and its relationship to proxy. So kudos to you. You have definitely achieved your calling as academicians in this particular area. So go forth and keep doing great things. Um, I'd like to remind the audience that if you found our discussion enlightening, I encourage you to look at our curriculum and course dates at the JSAL public webpage at socom.mil slash JSAL and click on courses. Also take the time to explore our other JSAL Press publications on this topic and many other similar topics. For feedback on Think JSAL or to nominate potential speakers, please contact us at thinkjsal at socom.mil. This series is brought to you by the Institute of Soft Strategic Studies of the Joint Special Operations University. <laughs>
Thank you all for listening.